Welcome, welcome, welcome back to Brick City. This is the real Charlemagne. Um, I want to give a shout out to everybody out there listening on this uh, Saturday afternoon. Could be doing other things, but you're out here listening to me, and I really appreciate it. Shout out to my family and friends supporting me um, on this podcast and um, broadcast and all my endeavors. Really appreciate you guys. Uh, today, got a vet. Guy I met a few years ago at a uh, at a grand event, man, and like I said, we connected ever since. You know, he's he's a really good guy, doing a lot of things in mental health in the community. Owns a business in Kingston, um, Brighton Counseling, Britain Counseling. I'm sorry, and in Virginia, Neil Genesis. Welcome to the show, Kendrick Britton. How you doing, brother? What's going on, Mac? I mean, how you been? Hey, I'm great, man. Great, man. You know, just trying to survive this pandemic. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's been tough for a lot of people. Yeah, man. You know, while, we, while we're talking about that, tell us a little bit about your background and how you get how you got into mental health, man. Well, um, man, I've been in mental health for a long time now. It's been about 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, I actually started, um, you know, it's, it's funny how I got into it, uh, Mac. I started uh, pre-med at ECU. Okay. Back in um, back in the nineties, after transitioning from the military, <clears throat> and um, uh, man, it, it, it I wasn't ready for it, buddy. And and so I transitioned from pre med biology to psychology, okay. and psychology worked for me a whole lot better. Right. And um, you know, I got a bachelor's from ECU in psychology, and, and you just kept going. You know, yeah. start started getting a few advanced degrees and being licensed in North Carolina, Virginia, as, okay. a, as a counselor, substance okay. abuse and mental health. So okay. that's, that's how I got started. Cool, cool, cool. I know, you know, I, I, I used to dabble in it back in the day, man. Um, I first got in the military, same thing. You know, I'm kind of a big dude, so they they want me to work with them, them kids that got little <laughs> behavior mm. issues, oh. <laughs> use that intimidation factor. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So I was out in the community side um, which was which was good, man. Until you know they they sort of changed a lot of policies and procedures, and I was yeah. like, you know, it's time for me to step away. But you on the clinical side of it, um, have you seen what what type of shift have you seen in those twenty years from then to now that has improved or has hurt the mental health industry? Um, you know, Mac, there's been a lot of highs and lows in mental health, especially mm -hmm. in North Carolina. Um, you have a period of time when you had a lot of providers in the field. Mm -hmm. It was honestly, it was oversaturated. People doing things that they, sh they shouldn't have done, you know, right. in terms of building practices and unethical uh, practices when it came to providing clinical services. Um, and then it really, you know, the state kind of tightened things up and a lot of those providers were pushed out mm -hmm. um, on, almost to the point where there was a deficit in providers. Gotcha. Um, and honestly, right now, it feels as though um, there aren't services out there, enough services out there for the community. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's an unfortunate situation, um, especially, you know, in the pandemic. You know, a lot of people didn't realize, you know, as I said all the time, you don't realize who you are until you got to deal with yourself, right. <laughs> you know, and a lot of people having to deal with themselves now. And, you know, being, you know, quarantined or what have you, you know, away from family members. Oh, yeah. um, so have you seen an increase or decrease in, in behaviors or, you know, substance abuse in, in within the last year since we've been in this pandemic? Oh, yeah, I think statistically we can um, verify that substance abuse, domestic violence, all forms of depression have increased over the last year year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, in practice, I think I've seen um, probably uh, more substance use, people just who've used quite often. Okay. I think there was a, there was a spike in substance use over the um, last year or so, where, and now people are coming to terms that maybe they have an issue. Okay. okay. Um, or, or family members were able to see that maybe some of their family members have issues that were unresolved. And gotcha. so um, a lot of, there were more referrals, more people coming in, um, seeking out services for things that they've been dealing with for some time now. 
Got you. Got you. And, um, you know, just, uh, just to touch on your business for a second. Mm -hmm. Um, how can people reach you? Um, if they, you know, in the Virginia, and and like you said, give your specific locations, you know, so people could reach you, um, or, you know, someone want to link up with you to have a, you know, uh, another interview on another platform. Yeah. So in Virginia, the the name of the company is Neogenesis Foundation is we are, we're based out of Newport News, Virginia. Okay. Uh, the, the number up there is 757-251-2541. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we, we have a, a decent size operation out there. We, we've done pretty good throughout the pandemic. Again, a lot of mental health issues. We, we, serve, <clears throat> sorry, we serve severe psychiatric disorders in the community. Um, we, do, we have intensive in-home, we have outpatient counseling. There's quite a few services in Virginia. Mm-hmm. In North Carolina, there's Britain Counseling Services. We're based out of Kinston. Okay. However, we serve uh, most areas in, in eastern North Carolina. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we take pretty much all insurances uh, in, in North Carolina. And in Virginia, we only take Medicaid. Okay. Uh, and I think Blue Cross Blue Shield up there now. Uh, and so we, we, you know, we're willing to come to a person's residence. We're willing to meet people in the community. Um, we're not just housed and, and a lot of therapists want to sit behind a desk or sit in their pretty office and provide right. services. Uh, we really try to meet the patient or the client where, where they are. Uh, oh, wow. and sometimes that requires that we get out of the office. That's huge. Um, because like you said, sometimes people tend to open up more when they're on the, in their own environments. You know what I mean? Right. And I, I know, I know you don't want to put yourself or any of your staff in, at risk, yeah. you know, however, you know, you need to, you know, like you said, sometimes it's need to, you need to get out in the community and, and get people in, in the, on, the, on their own turf, as, as we say, you know, <laughs> back in. And like I said, that that's huge um, with that process, man, because I know a lot of people, like you said, they just want to bring someone into their office and just have them sit down and then say, hey, you know, open up to me. But I'm like, I'm in an unfamiliar place. And, you know, um, and then, yeah. like I said, you can kind of break down that, that first layer of of just being able to communicate. That's the that's the initial key is being able to communicate. Right. And then once you get that first layer broken down, I think that's, you know, that's that's huge. And I, I applaud you and your staff for, for doing things like that, man. And that's, right. that's real big. Um, so, you know, any other things that you provide that are kind of off the off the beaten path? You know, that you, like you said, that's like you said, you go to your clients versus they come to you sometimes and that nature. Anything else that you do that's kind of innovative? Um, you know, of course, we do virtual counseling now. Um, okay. During the pandemic, uh, we do the entire process, intake, everything okay. over the computer. You know, right. that's, that's pretty simple at this point. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I get, I guess Charlemagne is really just in a relationship. We try to build relationships from the ground up. Okay. We truly try to meet a person where they are. Right. Um, and we realize how difficult it is for a person to talk to a complete stranger, you know, right. um, especially in our community where the trust just isn't, um, <laughs> it just isn't there um, when it comes yeah. to professionals in general. Yeah. It's, speaking of trust in our community, um, Community awareness of mental health, man. Um, I think that's a huge topic we don't touch on a lot in our community. You right. know, I, I'm, you know, I, I, we are, we both from the South, mm-hmm. and you know, throw it at the altar is has been the motto for years. Leave it at the altar. Right. <laughs> yes. And, and, and sometimes I think you know, once people get out of that, you know, nothing, not knocking that at all, but. Once you leave those walls, mm. then what? You know, right, once you right. leave that altar, then what? I think that's the problem sometimes in our community that you need that follow up, you need that confidant, you need that you know something to take the spiritual side to another level as well. You know, yeah. and, and um, you know, sometimes it's in the natural, which you come into play. <laughs> Right, Charlemagne. So, if I think the biggest advocate, um, I think in our community, um, 
the spiritual leaders probably could be the busy, busy, busiest, I'm sorry, biggest advocates for physical health matters mm -hmm. in, in addition to mental health matters. Right. And, and so unfortunately, a lot of spiritual leaders would say or, or do say, just leave it at the altar. They don't mm -hmm. necessarily recognize mental health as a discipline mm -hmm. um, that could be utilized in addition to um, um, spiritual health right, or right. spiritual, you know, giving spiritual guidance. Right. Um, and so uh, I think that if we could somehow partner in the mental health, mental health community with spiritual leaders, Right. Um, to just talk about, hey, you know, while you're working on your spiritual health, let's also talk about this mental health over here. Right. Let's talk right. about the fact that you need to go get your physicals every year. Right. Uh, right. That, that's something that uh, would definitely help tear down some barriers mm -hmm. and uh, maybe bridge the gap between us over here in the professional community and some of the people that we need to serve. Got you. I know uh, I'm not going to put him on blast because he's mm -hmm. still working towards his master's degree right now. But mm -hmm. I, I know one pastor that actually took it upon himself and sat down and understood that route and said, hey, with the things that's coming at me, I could give them spiritual knowledge, but from a substance abuse standpoint, from a, you know, standpoint of molestation, things like that. He didn't know how to tackle those things. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, and so he he said, man, I, I, he, then he went and got substance abuse counseling uh, degree. And then he's now he's going towards his master's degree to become um, uh, a, a clinical social worker, I believe. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, just understanding, man, and, um, you know, understands more to that piece than the spiritual side. And, um, you know, a le spiritual leaders, we're not knocking you. <laughs> but like you said, he just want to want to partner with you and yeah. say, "Hey, th this is a this is an issue," and just try to provide more knowledge to you. You know, and that's the thing. Um, I'm always seeking knowledge about different things and understanding because it's hard to help someone that you don't understand and you never been there. You know, what I'm saying yeah. I I didn't understand addiction until I started working in mental health. I was like, "Oh, you could just stop smoking. Oh, you could just stop using drugs." You know, but that was me because I never experienced that. Yeah, but then you know, I was like, I thought about it. I said, sugar is probably the worst drug out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I used to be addicted to McDonald's tea. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm addicted to Starbucks right now. Right, man. you know. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. people don't realize what addiction they they always you know they 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 always try to co co to associate it with alcohol and drugs. Yeah. And, and like you say, it's many other addictions out there. And, and could you elaborate about that a little bit further? Because you're the professional about mm -hmm. addiction and, and just tell some people, because I know some people have sex addiction, yeah. you know, uh, abuse, abuse, you know, that cause cert certain addictions. Could you touch yeah. on that for a little bit? Yeah. So when, you, when someone comes to the office and they present issues, they have a presenting problem, we look at how that problem impacts their life in a negative mm -hmm. way. And so if they say, I, I drink alcohol, one thing that I would say or that I might ask is, okay, so how does that impact your life? You know? And so if they say, I drink too much, I spend too much money, it takes me away from my family, um, I, I have a DUI, I, you know, I'm in court or whatnot, it's easier for me to say, okay, so it, it looks like that's, that it has presented as a problem for you. And that's something we need to work on. We need to figure out um, how to take this, this addiction that you have uh, to alcohol and um, resolve some of the issues that, that might trigger it. Mm -hmm. And so the, <clears throat> oftentimes alcohol is triggered by things. Addictions in general are triggered by things. Mm -hmm. And those things can be um, emotional. Mm -hmm. They can be um, trauma. Right. It, you know, oftentimes they're trauma related uh, triggers. Right. And, and that people aren't even aware of. Right. And so we want to dive deep into the, where the triggers, are, what the triggers are right. and, wh and where they came from. Okay. And so, uh, and, and again, people can be addicted to, to other people. They can be addicted to so many things. You know, mm -hmm. I, I used to think that I was addicted to uh, sugar myself. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I had to try. It was hard to honestly break away from it. I had to have a cupcake every day. Right. And, 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 it was, <laughs> and it's tough. You know, you start right. gaining weight. Yeah. And so I was just like, okay, I'm gaining weight and I don't want to gain weight. But at yeah. the same time, it's hard to stop eating cupcakes. I understand. And so it, that's how addiction works. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people don't understand addiction. They just, they just automatically assume it's drugs, alcohol. Drugs, alcohol. Right. And like right. I said, there's many addictions out there. <laughs> Yeah, um, and, and honestly, when I say the addiction to people, right? Sometimes we can get in bad relationships, right? And, and a lot of the issues that I've helped, had to deal with through the pandemic are relationship issues. Oh wow! And people and people get in bad relationships, and they mm-hmm. they find out sitting home with one another, and they don't necessarily like a lot of things about that person. <laughs> um, and and but at the same time, um, they don't. They don't necessarily want to leave them either, even when they're they're unhealthy relationships. Right, right. Um, and so that's something to definitely to you know talk to a counselor about to assess initially. I wouldn't, I don't think divorce is always the answer, but right, right, right. Just kind of figure out what things are is important. What things are, right? And like they said, I, I totally agree with you because um, I, I look at some people, you know, and they're like, "Oh, well, I got thirty years in. Um, I might as well just stay here." You know what I mean? I'm like, that's not always good, you know, because <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping that you got some more years of life left, you know, and you don't want to be unhappy for the duration of life, you know, yeah. um, because it, life is very precious. And um, sometimes we get caught up in that time versus, mm. <laughs> versus, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. what, what's actually healthy for us, you know, because like I said, we can't eat pork every day, right. and you, you know, and you, you, you do things in moderation and it's just like an unhealthy relationship. You can't come home unhappy every day, hating to go home. Right. That, that wears and tears on your nervous system and everything. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and it just leads to, like you said, it leads to addiction to other things, you know, because mm-hmm. you want to, you home, oh. but you want to be good somewhere else. Right. Right. And, and, <laughs> and you, you know, need something and, to take you somewhere else. This is true. <laughs> so coping, you know, a lot of times we use addiction as, as a, a form of coping with things that we, right. that are unresolved. Right. You know, we have a bad day. Um, instead of kind of dealing with the the anger that we felt or the mm-hmm. sadness that we felt, the disappointment that we felt throughout the day, we we drink. Right, right. Until we don't feel it anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to smoke weed until um, uh, marijuana. I guess I better use. <laughs> oh, you fine. You fine. We got a diverse audience. <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> you smoke marijuana until you know you you feel better about your day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Versus just talking to someone about it and, and dealing with it in a healthy manner. So developing healthy coping mechanisms are, and that, that's definitely important in therapy. All right. One, one thing, um, let, I, I want to clear the air about PTSD, man. Um, yeah. Everybody associate PTSD with us. We, we both huh. vets. Military, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could you explain to, to some of the people out here you could have anyone could have PTSD from any type of trauma, any type of events in their life, good or bad. You could have some type of PTSD from anything that affects your life traumatically. Could you explain yeah. that a little bit? Yeah. So post traumatic stress disorder, that's what it is. It's any type of trauma, if if you were in an abusive relationship mm-hmm. um, and in your next relationship, all you think about is being hit. When you're thinking about being abused, mm-hmm. that can be a form of, of PTSD. Mm-hmm. If you were in a bad accident mm-hmm. and um, you're hesitant to drive because mm-hmm. you have a, an extreme fear of of having the same type of accident, that can that can be a form of PTSD. Right. And that's just something that needs to be diagnosed by a professional. Um, and it honestly, it's an anxiety disorder that doesn't often go away on its own. Mm -hmm. Um, It's something that a lot of people use medication for. um, Mm -hmm. Medication is not necessarily the answer for for, Mm -hmm. um, mental health disorders all the time, but a lot of people use medication for PTSD um, or stress disorders in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, there there are different therapies out there that can definitely help with uh, PTSD now. Okay, okay. Yeah, because like I said, it's a misconception, man, because a lot of people, they automatically associated with the military and like, you know, someone, a civilian and never touched the military. Well, how you got PTSD? You never been in the military. And I'm like, that's just a misconception. Yeah. You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. 
I run into that a lot, man. And it's like, you know, and then they automatically assume everybody's been in the military has PTSD, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't feel like I do, but. <laughs> right. <clears throat> I mean, like I said, there's it, been some things that I, I, I felt like, you know, you know, happened. And like I said, I dealt with it, you know, it kind of came to terms with it, but. I'm good now, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Don't keep me away. Yeah. Yeah, look, and I, like I said, I don't, I don't turn to no uh, McDonald's tea no more. <laughs> right. Look, they, I think that was my coping mechanism for a while, man. I got out. I, I, I was drinking like three or four of them joints a day, and um, I think that was just Big my, one? I think that was my coping thing. Yeah, and um, I got up to like almost 400 pounds. Then you know what I'm saying? Gotcha. But um, gotcha. you know, like you said, I think that was just my coping. You know, and like I said, I think, honestly, I think I went to a deep, I'd never sought counseling, but um, I think I went to a deep depression when I got in the military. Yeah. And um, like I said, I just, I didn't work out. I was like, everything that I was about in the military, I'm not going to do. I'm not going to be on time. I'm not going to work out. I'm not going to, you know what I'm saying? Everything that was social in the military, I just dropped it. But like I said, I just, I think it was just a depression. Yeah. I got you. (laughs) Yeah, I think it was just depression. And like I said, a lot of people, you know, we, we discussed that, you know, prior to, to getting on to the uh, recording, we was talking about just the transition from military to civilian life is just, mm. it's just hard on a lot of people, you know, a lot of veterans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, think, I think a lot of, you, know, you don't have always have a plan. No. You know, you, you have a skill set. I was a medic in, in the military. Mm-hmm. And so that's, you know, I knew I was going to get out and be a, a medical doctor. Um, and so that's how, <laughs> that's why I went that, that route with, uh-huh. um, with pre-med at ECU. But uh, yeah. it wasn't, it just wasn't in the cards, right. you know? Right. Um, so I had to find myself. And oftentimes people leaving the military, they got to find themselves, man. Exactly. You know, I didn't graduate with, the, you know, I mean, not graduate, but uh, leaving the military with a retirement plan, you know? Right, right, right. right. Um, I had to make my way. Right. Um, th- thankfully, they helped me pay for my the school, my, yeah. my schooling. But right. at the same time, I had to find my way, and a lot of people do, yeah. and, and it's hard. A lot of people get lost in that way. I, I went to ECU for a while, man. And it was like I, j- I just feel like I didn't fit in. Right. You know what I'm saying? I went there. I, I got. I got. I think I got out in '04. I went there for a while, and um, it was just like I don't fit in. All these kids here, you know. Mm. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I was like 28, 29 at the time. Like, I don't fit in with these kids, you know. And um, like you said, it was just, like you said, it was just a transition, transition, man. Just figuring out your way. I was in artillery, so yeah, ain't nothing out here for that. (laughs) Unless I went back and trained, you know, on the civilian side, you know. But, I mean, I was like, man, once I got out, I was like, I'm done with it. But now I try to be an advocate for vets, you know, and try to help them push them in the right direction and push them to the right resources. Yeah. Um, speaking of resources, one more time, let people know how to get up, get a contact with you on um, social media, you know, or email. Just let them know one more time, and then um, I got one more question for you. Yeah. Um. So, in Kinston is BritainCounseling.org. Okay. That is our website. You can go there. There's a number. Um, you can actually schedule an appointment online. Okay. Um. So BritainCounseling.org. And uh, Virginia is uh, NFI. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't know my own website. It's <laughs> NFIVA.org. Okay, um, okay. That's for Neogenesis Foundation in, in, Kent, I mean, in Virginia. Right. And again, you can go up there, schedule an appointment, all the numbers and the, the address, it, it, you know, it's all there. If you have any questions, you can send, um, send questions and what, and, and we, we try to respond within 24 hours. Okay. And so. That's awesome. <clears throat> All right, then. Last, last thing, brother. We run a little short on time. Mm-hmm. Um, closing my show, everybody got to drop a nugget. Okay. You got to drop a nugget. If you got a young individual trying to get into the mental health field, as, you know, um, what do you suggest that they do before they enter the field? And if they interested in getting into the field, what do you suggest that, that they do? Okay. So first off, understand that at the bachelor's level, there's not a lot for mental health professionals. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it, it starts kind of at the master's level. Okay. Once, once you get there, 
you have to figure out what type of mental health professional you want to be. You know, okay. I, I chose the licensed clinical mental health counselor um, track. Some some people go licensed clinical social worker. Okay. Um, you have to do your research and figure out which one better serves uh, your purpose. <clears throat> uh, you know, it, a lot of times licensed clinical social workers, they're, they ha- they're able to get into certain arenas that LPCs or licensed clinical mental health counselors cannot. Um, and so that's something to look into. They're able to build different types of insurance. Gotcha. Um, and so that's something to, to look into. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's definitely something that uh, I would, any, anyone coming into the field, I would tell them to, to, to do. Got you, got you. All right, man. Look, I appreciate that, brother. Because, like I said, we um about to close out. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate you, man. Look, we we'll link up at the gym sometime soon. Absolutely. <laughs> Joy, I see you. Yeah, yeah, man. We 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 got to link up. And um, like I said to the listening audience, yeah, this is a good guy. Definitely, if you have any issues or think you possibly even the little smallest <laughs> issue reach out reach out because he's definitely a good guy and he, he's definitely points you in the right direction if if you need help once again let me, um, let me leave my my phone number uh for okay. the office too Charlemagne. so it's 252-522-9151 that is for the kinston office if anybody has any questions they can definitely hit us up we um either me or one of the office staff would answer the phone here guy and give you a call back within 24 hours hey there you go Hey, thanks a lot, people. Hey, remember to follow me on all platforms. Hey, until next Saturday, this is The Real Charlemagne signing off. You guys have a good one. Take care.